I went downtown on Friday to the rally that was held at Federal Plaza. It was a massive crowd spilling out from the plaza into the streets. I was surrounded by people from all walks of life, parents with children in their strollers, elders who remember the years before Roe v. Wade, teenagers with hand-scrawled signs. I passed coalitions of teachers and workers unions and feminists. I passed an older gentleman in a suit on his bike with a baseball cap that proudly declared that he was there as a legal observer. I passed a young person about my age who was preparing their first aid kit just in case so they could take care of others if needed. And I had this thought, one that I've had at protests before. This feels like the kingdom of God. I woke yesterday morning with my heart feeling heavy, so I decided to fill my morning with some of my favorite things. I stayed in bed a little later and read a chapter of my book. I went and took care of my neighbor's cats and had some sweet animal snuggles. Then I went down to the farmer's market and I bought three big yellow tomatoes. Is there anyone else who loves when we enter tomato season? And a box of peaches and then I went to the French cafe and I got an almond croissant. And I looked around at all the storefronts preparing for the parade today. And I smelled the, the scent of fresh rain and I thought to myself, this too, this too feels like the kingdom of God. And here I am today at church. This wild thing we do, do you ever think about that? This is wild that we do this. We come together from all of our diverse backgrounds and we share what's happening with our lives, our fears, our joys, and sometimes we get a little annoyed with each other, but we keep doing it. And I'm again thinking to myself, this too, this too feels like the kingdom of God. So I have joy this morning, my friends, I do. I'm cultivating it this morning because we are together and I don't feel so alone. And because honestly, this is one of my favorite Sundays of the year. It's one of my favorites because I get the privilege of celebrating pride as a pastor of this church. I have the privilege to declare from the pulpit this morning that God loves you. That feels so important this morning, especially God loves you, exactly you. This is part of why I became a pastor, to worship like this in ways I didn't always see growing up. It's a critical part of my spirituality and the way that I have come to understand who God is. We've recognized pride throughout the month of June, but this weekend and this Sunday are important days because this is the anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, which began on June 28, 1969. You may have noticed that the cover of our bulletin this morning is an image of Marsha P. Johnson, one of the saints of this movement. We celebrate pride at Hyde Park Union Church because we are an open and affirming congregation. That means that this church years ago decided that we were going to be a welcoming and a safe space for the LGBTQIA community. This Sunday is a way of honoring that sacred commitment to God, to one another, and to our community. And so we celebrate today. And as we celebrate, I want to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. These qualities that we're meant to cultivate and to pursue as part of a Christian life. 
We learn about the fruits of the Spirit from the book of Galatians. This is one of many letters that Paul writes to the early Christian communities. Remember that these letters are always contextual. Paul is always writing to specific communities that are facing specific problems. And the church community in Galatia was embroiled in conflict. There were two main groups there at the time. The Jewish Christians, those coming to the teachings of Jesus from the background of Judaism, and the Gentile Christians, those coming from a Gentile background. And the two were arguing about ritual observance. Did Gentile Christians need to observe the rituals named in the Hebrew Bible? Rituals like circumcision and a kosher diet. And there were different opinions. And there were different teachings. And there was a lot of arguing. This may initially seem unrelatable for Christians today. But if you think about it, they're arguing about how to be together. How do we be together when we're different? How do we do this thing called Christianity when we have different lifestyles and different bodies and different ethnicities and different practices? And I think that's something we can relate to after all. So Paul writes to the Galatians to give them guidance, and he starts with this concept of freedom. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now, right off the bat, I want to clarify that Paul is not saying that Jewish rituals are a yoke of slavery. We have to be careful when we interpret texts like these, that we don't do it in an anti-Semitic way. Paul is not saying that Jewish rituals are wrong or that they do not matter. What he is saying is that not everyone has to practice these rituals. Jewish Christians could practice them if they wanted to, but Gentile Christians did not have to. They weren't required to do so. Paul says these rituals and laws, they have a place, but they're not what make you a Christian. Paul is setting up something that theologians call a theological anthropology. That's a fancy way of saying that he's talking about what makes us human in the eyes of God. And one of those things is freedom. And as Baptists and as UCC denomination, that is big for us, freedom. God gives each of us the ability and the right to make our own decisions. Paul reminds us that we are free, that we are people of liberation. And because of this, we don't have to let anyone else make decisions about our anatomy. We are people of liberation set free to work on behalf of liberation in the world. That's good news. And this does not mean that we should just do whatever we want. This line stood out to me when I heard Anna read it today. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. I think some people need to read Paul today. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. Freedom, says Paul, is linked to communal well-being. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. If you know it, you can say it with me. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We've heard that before, right? This is God's love ethic. And it underlies everything. We are people of liberation called to live in loving relationship with ourselves, with God, and with one another and all creation. This theological anthropology, this thing that God wants for us, it's freedom and love working together. What does that look like, you might ask? Well, freedom and love working together means I get to make choices about my body, and I trust you to make choices about your body that are right for you. 
Freedom and love working together means that sometimes I need to give up certain things and privileges to make sure that you are safe and healthy. Freedom and love working together means that my well-being is the same thing as your well-being and all of creation's well-being. Freedom to be ourselves and a love that guides our decision-making. That's what God wants for us. Now, once Paul has established this, he takes a hard turn into writing about the flesh. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. Oh, my friends, there is a long history of interpreting this kind of verse to mean that bodies are bad. If you grew up in a church like me, you probably heard that your body is bad and you need to be careful. Bodies are bad and our desires need to be squashed and you need to be so careful because the devil's going to use it. Well, I think that is some bad theology to say the least. I think Paul is making an ethical distinction not an ontological one. I know, some more fancy words this morning. What I mean is that Paul is talking about morals, not about physicality. The distinction between spirit and flesh is less about body versus not body, and more about being God-centered rather than idolatrous, putting something other than God at the center of our lives and gravitating around it. We could rewrite this verse to say something like, live by God's love ethic, not by the desires of the empire. Let me say that again because I think it's really important. Live by God's love ethic and not by the desires of the empire. Love your neighbor as yourself even if the empire says or writes or publishes something different. Paul gives us then some examples in the form of a big list of vices. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I have three things to say about this list. First, this is Paul's list. Maybe we could all spend some time later and decide whether we think it's right or not. I would add some things personally. Homophobia, racism. The second thing I have to say about this list is that it is impossible. We're not perfect. All of us are going to do something on this list at some point, maybe at many points, and that is okay. Thankfully, we are part of a tradition that offers us ways to ask for forgiveness and to make things right. And third, this is a really common teaching technique at the time. Other teachers and philosophers created similar lists. But Paul's has something special. Paul includes things that are both about individual well-being and communal well-being. Several of the things he lists are about how we can be in relationship to one another. It comes back to that love ethic, that freedom and love working together. So once he's told us what not to do, Paul does the natural thing. He tells us what to do, what to cultivate. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness gentleness, and self-control. We know what these words mean, but what exactly is a fruit of the Spirit? These are qualities that grow, just like fruit grows, from being planted in good soil, from being planted in the Holy Spirit. These are qualities that come from living a life grounded in the ethic of freedom and love. These are qualities that we show when we've been transformed by the divine. It's all about transformation, my friends. Remember that Paul is writing to the Galatians and especially to the Gentile Christians. 
They wanted a way of showing this transformation in their lives. They wanted a way of marking this radical thing that they had learned, of demonstrating their relationship with God. And Paul is saying that circumcision or a diet, that's one way of doing it, but it's not the only way. That there is also a noticeable difference that comes when we are transformed by God. Something that shows up in these fruity qualities. Now I could talk about any one of these fruits, and maybe that's a sermon series later, that we go through them one by one, but as I end, I want to bring us to joy this morning. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a quality that comes from that love ethic. Joy is something we can and that we should pursue in our lives. We are transformed by joy and for joy. And let me tell you, Pride Sunday exemplifies that as well as anything I can think of. I want to share a quick story with you about my first official Pride Sunday at the church that I was at in New York. It was in Midtown Manhattan near the theater district and there were several performers and artists who were part of our congregation and who would contribute to our worship on occasion. And on that Pride Sunday, we were treated to a drag performance to the song, I Am What I Am by Gloria Gaynor. If you don't know that song, here are some of the lyrics. I am what I am. I don't want praise. I don't want pity. I bang my own drum. Some think it's noise. I think it's pretty. And so what if I love each sparkle and each bangle? Why not try to see things from a different angle? Your life is a sham till you can shout, I am what I am. That queen had the whole sanctuary on their feet, dancing and singing along. It was transformative joy. It was freedom and love. It was abundantly and spiritually fruitful. I'm going to watch the pride parade after worship. The first one held after two years of a pandemic, one being held in the face of very real threat. And when I watch it, I will be pursuing joy the entire time. And I will be thinking about these words from Isaiah 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. A highway will be there. And it will be called the way of holiness. This Sunday in communities across the land, hot pavement will be strewn with glitter. There will be a highway of joy. Individuals who have felt excluded will be seen and celebrated. Children who need hope for their futures will see it. People will rejoice and sing and dance. And that joy will be an act of resistance. We need joy and hope. We need freedom and love to fuel us for what is to come because I believe we are in a time when Christianity is either going to reclaim what Jesus actually said or it is going to die. So let's reclaim it this Sunday. Let's reclaim that joy and love and freedom and hope and draw the circle wide and wider and say to one another, you are loved and so am I. Amen.